off. So uh, just by way of introduction, uh, so my name is Sabrina Robinson. I'm the wellbeing lead working within the People and Transformation function at Essex County Council. Uh, I'm also a member of the Bain Network. So a bit of history uh, around today's session and the network. So the Black, Asian and Minority Ethnic Employee Network uh, are collaborating with Essex Libraries and Essex County Council to celebrate Black History Month, uh, which obviously we are uh, recognising throughout October. Uh, the Black History Month is an annual celebration of the history, achievements and contributions of Black people in the UK. Uh, it was first launched in 1987. Uh, it's also a time for continued action to tackle racism, inequality, reclaim and ensure black history is represented and celebrated. Uh, we have a month long program of virtual events, activities and contents. Hopefully people have had the opportunity to engage in these. Uh, and that includes a range of speakers, book recommendations uh, and also podcasts with Essex libraries as well. Uh, so just to kick things off then for today's session, so without further ado, I do welcome Eve Wright. Uh, so a bit of history on Eve Wright, welcome uh, to the session first of all. Uh, but Eve Wright is a Black British artist, an award-winning creative director, and artist of Tilbury Bridge Walkway and Memories 2020, which is the first site-specific art and sound installation to be held at the Port of Tilbury in Essex and the UK, which is dedicated to the people of the Rindrush generation. Uh, so in terms of the format for today's session, there'll be a conversation between myself and Eve Wright. I'll be asking a few questions. Uh, there'll then be a presentation by Eve Wright and a great video as well. Uh, and then we'll open out to the Q&A. So welcome Eve Wright to this session. Hello. Welcome. welcome. Thank you for inviting me. Um, and um, I mean, I, I want to say, um, just to, uh, before I introduce Irony Richards, my producer, um, that song we played when you were waiting that was um by the south landerners they are uh, uh, in, in the 60s were quite well known sort of like equivalent to sort of like the temptations british equivalent and um one of the lead singers out alan wilmer passed away yesterday uh 96 and he's featured on the installation uh, Tilbury Walker of memory. So uh, I just wanted to play that track as a tribute to him. Um, um, but before I go further, I just want to say um, thank you to Ione, my producer from Evrite Arts. She's a producer, co-founder, and she's also a writer and artist and in her own right. So just say thank you for being here and supporting the organization and helping us do some of the work that I'll probably talk about later on. And thank you for Essex Council for inviting us to do this talk on Black History. Thank you, thank you so much. And yes, thank you to all of you uh, for the session. I think I've already had a bit of an insight into what we're gonna to cover today and it is really, really interesting. So uh, hopefully we'll get some good engagement from our audience during the Q&A as well. Mm. Uh, so we'll start by kicking off uh, our conversation. Uh, so my first question, Eve, right, is so October is obviously Black History Month. Uh, how do you associate with Black History Month, first of all? Well, I mean, Black History Month has been quite important uh, in terms of, for me as an artist, um, in a sort of, in a sort of kind of, it's, it was a, before it happened, there wasn't really a focus on Black History. We weren't really talking about it. In, in the mainstream and I felt when they introduced it I thought it was a great opportunity for us all as a community whether you're black uh white Irish white British uh you know we're, we're you've seen the, the the applications we've got to fill in of the various different communities that live in Britain uh but I felt this was important to have one month where we talk about the sort of like the black British historical experience um, and to me, it's so valuable. Um, and um, it, it became, it becomes, a, I almost, in a sense, we call it the Black Employment Month, in a sense. Uh, so in a way, it has its downsides because it seems as though that everything should happen this month, but it's a start. But in a sense, Black, Brit black history is essentially 360, 360 days in a year. You know, it's, 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 it's with us always. So, it, but it's a great to have a month where we can just focus on on history and and um, so I use it as an opportunity to to um, uh, kind of like highlight some of the work I'm doing, really. You know. 
Okay. Um, and you've touched on it a bit already, but why do you think it's so important? And I'm just thinking, obviously, reflecting that it started in 1987. Um, I guess my second question to that would be sort of how do you think that things have changed during that time in terms of celebrating Black History Month? Um, I think, I mean, um, in a sense, I, I think things are getting better. Um, especially uh, since last year, I think um, because of the Black Lives Matter movement, I think a lot of the temperature, a lot of organisations, mainstream organisations, corporate organisations, a lot more aware of Black history. Uh, councils, you know, I've been invited to talks this month alone with various corporate organisations last year also uh, to talk about history. Um, but I think there's a lot more to be done because I feel... Um, I just feel that uh, not just for this month, but continually, I feel Black history needs to be focused focused on what what my I say pass the microphone, and uh, I say that to mainstream me media. I mean, pass it on. Um, there's certain there's certain individuals in the media are still there. There's, they get in, in terms of radio, TV presenters, etc. They're always the same faces all the time, do it saying the same having the same conversations and they bring black people on in a, I feel quite talk in a tokenistic manner and I feel um I think we need to be brave enough as a, as a community to pass the microphone give black like channel four did something this year which was amazing they had one night of continual black content where black presenters were presenting programs there were black programs on there and they did that throughout throughout the night and it was a great opportunity for them to sort of investigate language, investigate content. And I, I love that. But that's, that just should happen not just one day. You know, it's about passing a microphone. Unless we, unless this, our communities in Britain start embracing difference, because the difference was started, you know, not just on, 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 on Windrush, it's way before then. We should embrace our difference as a community and celebrate that throughout throughout the year. And, and I think it's when I see Black History, yes, it's a kind of shorthand. We've given them a month, but no, we don't want a month. We want a year, you know. So um, so when I work as an artist, that's part of my my remit is is bringing more Black British stories to the forefront, to the to the I call it to the eye line. So so that so white audience who, who didn't engage with blackness um, before should engage with blackness and understand that we are we are the same we live on the same island but culturally there's not there, there is there's a difference and um i feel that um that difference is a celebration not a threat you know absolutely and i you know completely agree with that idea that yeah, great to have Black History Month, but we need to make sure that we're having those conversations and doing these things throughout the year. So, completely. thank you. Completely. Uh, so my next question is, could you tell us a little bit about your family and your journey to Britain and your upbringing? Well, I mean, I will talk about a little bit later on about my family, how I sort of, um, the journeys I've made. But uh, my mother, my mother and father uh, from Jamaica, my father uh, came on a boat. I'm not quite sure which one. I need to research that. But he came on one of the early boats in, in the 50s. Um, and uh, my mother followed um, uh, shortly after by plane. But my father and mother had, went, they were married and they had four children before my father even traveled to Britain. And, and, and his journey, my, I almost sense my journey to here started my, with my father. My father um, and mother lived in a place called Trinani uh, in, in a small town called Lorimer's in Jamaica. And in order to get here, my father used to travel. He did, if you imagine this very farming community in the mid, mid, middle part of Jamaica. So the, the, the yam farming is on, a, on slope. So in order to, the yam needs a lot of water. So my father used to go, the donkeys used to go down to the gully and he used to collect water to go up to the higher, fields to water the, the the yams and the various crops that are growing in that community and the money my father made there that was that what that is what he used as his fare to come to Britain so my father was very tenacious quite an ambitious man 
but I can see what he went through as a, as a, a young man with a family. And, and so his journey to Britain, when he got that call to uh, come to the UK and they, they were looking for work and people were talking about, can you imagine this young man hearing that? in Trelawney, in the middle of not in the middle of nowhere in Jamaica, hearing out the, that call to come to the motherland. It's amazing, sir. He's it was, it was, it was quite a tenacious individual. So his ambition um, and um, travelled that journey to Britain for the betterment of his family um, created a whole, you know, he, he almost, look, my family has prospered for, throughout since then. You know, he, he was the first pioneer and from that journey, um, I became, you know, I, I'm here today talking to you about journeys and talking to you about stories. You know, I, I ran a business, you know, I run companies and, you know, so it, it's a situation where that I just always think about that man, that individual, that young man making those, those journeys. I mean, that is how amazing, I need to think, I need to investigate that story even further. It's so amazing. I have made various trips to Jamaica. I must, I must add that point. I've gone back to my homeland. I've gone back to the location where it started. So uh, I'm a very much about journeys. My work is very much about that, you know, taking journeys and um, being tenacious and being focused and, and pursuing your dreams. You know, that's, that's very much about where I come from as a, as a young, as a young, right. We call the right, my mother called us the right breed. So that's the, her nickname for uh, the, the men in the family. So um, that's that's my beginnings in the UK. Yeah, sounds like some really great values instilled there from your parents as well. So very much so. I mean, a lot of lot of um, if you come on first generation. So if we we were we were fortunate enough to have that first generation Windrush generation hardcore discipline given to you know go to school learn your book you know all that stuff so we so I grew up in a very sort of like a very sort of um quite a disciplined structure yeah. where we had to um you know um pursue you know goals really yeah mm -hmm. and you mentioned about your uh trips back to Jamaica just wondered if you'd share a bit about that and your experiences well, that was amazing because um, I, I had a, one of the things I did and one of, the, I talk about it in my presentation, uh, walking drawings, where I make journeys. I made a journey around the uh, UK to find out, just to test the, the, the temperature, just to test whether, whether I wasn't, been, whether I live on an island or not. I know it sounds really funny, but that's when I went back to Jamaica. That's what I did. I traveled on a bus. It was very, it was way about a good 20 years ago even further, I can't remember my first trip to Jamaica. But at the time, the yam tr trucks used to run from um, Clarendon. So you could jump on a, a yam truck and head down, you know, the, the motorways. It's very, it's, there's no trains um, in Jamaica. So I got a chance to see the island from a perspective of not just a tourist, but from a, from a like a local in a sense. I dressed in my boots, you know, I did like a, almost like a, a, a you know, um, when you put the, uh, your, 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 your sack on your back as a young student. I took that journey. So as a sim, in, in a lot of my work comes out of those experiences, me searching for my, my history, me investigating my story. And a lot of the work I've done today had, and I'll, I'll talk about briefly about that. But, um, so I'm not afraid of going to unfamiliar territory, speaking to people that I don't know, um, traveling alone and if need be um, because I feel it, it's a part of my the world is a world is a is a is, is a big place you know and I think the first step for everyone is to find out where they come from you know find out where you are how you are what's wh why you wait wh why are you where you are today um, and yes you have an internet and we sit down with these really beautiful, nice phones, and um, we can look and see 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 a space where we think we might want to travel to on a plane. But there's a there's a there's, there's also value in going to a place, or taking a get, going on a road trip, not knowing where you're going, and just finding out about the community. You know, 
and 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 that's one of the reasons why you know the walking drawings and takeaway takeover and the bridge at Tilbury that came out of a lot of those journeys about me searching for um the search um you know searching for answers about being black and british because they don't tell you this in school they don't tell you don't they don't tell you any history when i was growing up i never i heard about henry the eighth i heard about queen elizabeth the second i heard about the the nazis and the germans i heard about all this history that didn't really relate to me i hear about african history that didn't really relate to me i didn't really so in a sense I'm always on that quest to find out more about my story, about where I am, you know, um, as a per individual. So, and it's quite important because I, and I bring those stories back and that features and that, that situates and that permeates through my artworks I make. Because I'm forever trying to find, I'm almost, being young black British growing up in the UK, you, you can get quite lost in because you don't see any representation of yourself anywhere. And you have to find that, you know, you got you've got to make an, an effort. Otherwise, you're just going to be on a, forever on this kind of am I British, aren't I? Am I Jamaican? Am I the Nigerian? Am I black Nigerian? Am I black British? You know, we all got these different labels continually kind of you know layered on top of us and but you can't own a label until you you've got to own it you've got to want to have that label i'm an englishman you know i'm a black man black british but i'm englishman i've grown in britain england and i own that label and i'm not ashamed of that label but you know i've got jamaican heritage i've got a good jamaican cultural heritage i've got an african heritage that i know about but i don't i still don't know about it but You've got to be able to look, take your labels and understand where they come from. And, 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 but you've got to go and see that I've been to Scotland. I've seen Scotland. Um, I know what right, right is part of a, is part of the, um, what do they call it? Part of the McIntyre clan in Scotland, the rights. To understand where my slave master's heritage comes from. So it's all about black, that's what I'm saying, black history month is also yes it's about history but it's also about you owning your history you know you going out and finding about your personal history as well as the, knowing about collective history you know so i think people should take these times to do that not only think about oh it's just about oh hearing about the wind rush and hearing about yes that is part of black history month but it's also about you collect you understanding where you are you know. Thank you. And that leads nice to my next question when we're talking about sort of journeys. So what, what's been your career journey so far? How have you got to where you are? Well, you know, I've, I've been very fortunate in the sense that, you know, I, I was a art director. Um, I, I started a, a company for my bedroom uh, of, uh, of 30 years ago called Creative Hands. Um, and I, I was probably one of the first black design agencies, started first black design agencies in the UK. Um, and uh, so I was a manager, so I, I built that up to a, like a 20 strong team. Um, and in 2004, we managed to sell the business and uh, it allowed me to think about art. I've always wanted to be an artist. Um, I was art director for 20 years. We did a lot of great work in the music industry. I mean, notably, uh, people talk about the Jamiroquai branding I did um, for the first two albums of that band and everyone loves those icon that iconic symbol and logo we designed and everything. But I did lots of bands, I did lots of commercials, um, Nike and various other things. So I started off from a very, from a, a very much a, a corporate um, beginning. And then, um, as I said, we were fortunate to, to sell the business on and, and then I, it gave me an opportunity to question myself as to what I wanted to do next. And then, in a sense, I actually went back to my art because that was really where it all began for me. And um, I felt after 20 years um, answering client briefs and doing all the commercial work, which I loved, 
I felt that art was a bit more, I was able to do a lot more with art and do, have my, a lot more my personal voice rather than doing a, working through an, a company, having a company's voice. And on that around your personal voice, how do you feel that your identity is affected within your work? Yeah, I mean, it's important to bring your, I think it's important to, my work is very much, I'm, I'm a visual artist, so I work across media, I do sculpture, I've seen some of my pieces behind Kissy Penny, I'm a, a, a film director, so I, my film, I work, make film, um, I do drawing and painting, like all artists, but, it, but the question is, um, what are you painting, what are you drawing about? And so I'm very much, my work is about my Black British experience, first and foremost. And then it's, it's from Black British experience and it goes back to the Caribbean for me and then go back to Africa. It's almost like I'm going the other way around. And if people talk about, oh, go to Africa. It's almost like I want to know about my Caribbean heritage and the slavery and what happened there. What was the conversation in the Caribbean, the colours, carnival, all of those amazing colours, and uh, so you see my paintings. You will do coming up over the next year or so. You see my paintings are full of colour. It's full of because of my my experience and journey to um, Grenada and the Karakou and and spending time there and seeing uh, the sort of like un. It's, it's a different type of carnival than one you see down in Notting Hill. It's a more kind of homemade. People making everyone in locally make their own types of costume, which is very haphazardly put together, but beautifully put together. And they do Shakespeare uh, fights with Shakespeare and they fight in, in you know, so, so it, and that's, that, that was a, um, that came out, that was in Karakou. So that came out of the slavery uh, where the slaves were, uh, carnival was like a day off from slavery. So the, the, obviously the slave master said, oh, we want to hear Shakespeare. So in, in Caracol, they do these slave, slave, um, Shakespeare contest fights with, with sticks and costume and words. So it's like, I'm saying there's so much. So that's where my work is influenced. It's very much about Black, British, first history. How can it not be? And then go back to Caribbean, Jamaica and the Caribbean experience, and then back to Jamaica. And hopefully our land in Africa. Who knows what will happen? But that's where that's where I'm going with my art practice. Excellent, thank you. Uh, and you sort of mentioned mentioned about sort of your experience, but what have been some of the challenges, but also opportunities that you faced as a black British man? Um, as I said, you know, come on, my father. I don't. I didn't get half the 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 not even a, a I, I just got we just get a small bit from what our parents experienced when they came to the UK I mean I, I was talking about it the other day I grew up with um films on on, on sitcoms called Love Thy Neighbour it's like a uh, there was sort of um, Alf Garnet and uh, I grew up with those types of sitcoms where people you know people blatantly you know, some mothers do have them. They were blatantly racist on the TV, mainstream. You know, the black, the, 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 the minstrel, black and white minstrel show. I mean, how bizarre that was how we're growing up. You know, we, we experienced those sort of things on mainstream TV. When people put those on TV today, you'd be shocked to see those things on TV. But that's how our upbringing, when you came, grew up, you know, people would racistly, racistly abuse you. You used to constantly, um, I grew up in South London, so we were constantly, um, there was a, especially in the 70s, when it was hard, there was a lot of racism, a lot of skinhead, uh, lots of, um, you know, rock against racism. There was a lot of um, tension on the streets, the Brixton riots, etc. So you, 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 every time we went out, we were stopped in a car, you know, we're always stopped going out to, to uh, a rave or whatever, you know, not a rave, we call them rave, but blues dance, you know. So, so when I went into the business world, yes, you know, we'll do five presentations, we may get one, you know. Some of them we were shortlisted at so many times and we never got them um, for whatever reason. But we, you know, that never stopped me. That didn't stop me because that one, you know, that one would be the one, that one would help, you know, and we would always over deliver on our, any other projects we got as a company. You know, we would just do work sometimes till, I remember I worked 40 
eight hours straight on a project to, to win a pitch. Um, because it was a, we were offered an opportunity, it was for the English National Opera at the time. And we were offered an opportunity to do this campaign. It was a big campaign for Alvin Ailey, I think. But we, it was a sense that the dance company, so it was a sense that we would always, we will always put that extra bit in there. Um, because it was important, you know, that we won things and we got things and we built, you know, I say we, because it was a great little team, you know, black and white, you know, but, but we, we, we but there was always obstacles, but I'm a, as I said, because I'm an Englishman, I've got that, that English, there's an English kind of tenacity. I can't explain it. I don't know what it comes from. I inherited it from my birthright in this UK where you, you know, you can see, you can see what they did with the European Union recently. I mean, there's just something about it being in, in, Britain, ground in Britain, whether you like it or not, you're Brexit, you're a Brexit supporter or not. There's always this bravery about the British. They, after all, they did conquer nearly all the world. So there's a, something that you inherit from that history also. So it's not, it's not also your blackness, you've got to understand that you're living in Britain, you inherit everything. You're culturally, you're in a cultural soup of everything. If you're in the soup, you're bound to get some of the flavors from other, the, other, the other vegetables, you know? And so for me, I have that, always have that tenacity of trying to try new things and don't be afraid to try new things. Don't be afraid to let go of a branch to go onto another tree. You know, you have to move on, you know, keep moving. And um, so, Yes, there's been obstacles, but I don't really, I don't, challenges, I call them, I don't linger on them. I, I'm like, it, you, it'd be very hard, you know, we put, I put artworks in um, takeaways in Colchester, you know, um, I put artworks on a bridge in Tilbury. I don't own a bridge, but we've got a, we've got a bridge, a 55 metre long bridge in, in Tilbury. You know, with, with black imagery on there, I don't own the bridge, but I negotiated to get the work on there. We've negotiated it on there. I do walking drawings on beaches that I don't even own. You normally in Britain, most of that, all the land's owned by someone. It's very small islands, land owners, where you get the permission, you got an insurance. I did walking drawings in, 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 in Cumbria on, on the Queen's land, owned by the Queen, it's owned by all of us. So you, there, are, there are ways around things, but to, you know, so you shouldn't let, let these obstacles stop you and shouldn't make colour be a barrier to what you want to do. Go and talk to communities, white communities. I, you know, I ended up going into these communities where I was the only black person sitting in a community in Cumbria. And um, they're like, what's he doing here? It was, a, it was a, like a closed community, but I said, I'm here to tell you, I'm going to be doing this walk and I really want you guys to be involved with my project. And they were like, oh, wow, great. You know, what's your name? You know, you understand? So it's just, just be not afraid of understand that this country is yours just as much as anybody else's. You know, leave London, go and see the landscape, go and find, you know, go and find communities, talk to them, go and walks. You know, they, I love these kind of, situation we see a lot of black people go on these walks i love that idea of us going on these walks and there's all, all black men walking and all white black women walking and you know i love it in in the, in the go on this is britain it's, it's yours you know us ancestors paid for this you know <laughs> in their lives you know slavery paid for this you know we are it's part of our it's part of our own it you know so don't be, I, I never, obstacles never stop me. Thank you. I, I could ask you so many more questions and I'm, I'm sure <laughs> others will have some in the chat as well. Uh, but we'll, we'll move on to the uh, presentation, if you wouldn't mind. So okay. uh, Eva's going to give a short PowerPoint presentation and then we'll have an audio visual presentation as well. So how, um, how long do you want to, how long we want the question and answers? About five minutes or so? Or? Uh, if we can have 10 minutes or so, that'd be good, but we'll see how we go. Okay, okay. So I'm going to show you, go, I'll go for a quick presentation. I'm going to share a screen. Um, and, uh, right. And let's share. Right, this is, if I someone can see that, um, I'm just going to quickly wish through some stuff because I've got a lot of, I've got a lot of uh, um, slides. And, um, you know, this is like making, uh, mark making in the public realm, 
claiming and preserving space for black British black for space for contemporary black British stories in my art space. So uh, I, I, I we talked about it earlier on when I said about how I I I put myself in the work, you know, and I say here, even a multidisciplinary visual installation artist challenges public environments to make space for black British stories to exist and thrive. I create mirrors where I can see and recognize myself to instigate conversations in the mainstream about what it means to be black and British in the UK today. And that's quite important. That is quite important. That's the question was out earlier on, but that's quite important about making space for conversations for black, because if we don't put our story out there, if we don't put visual imagery out there, I say we, because it's not just me, it's not my job to do it. As a black artist, I do it. As black, young black um, citizens, we, we do it, we try and do it, but it's also white citizens in order to facilitate that um, storytelling also. But not only for storytelling to the black experience, it's storytelling to the white experiences. So we all have these stories continually circulating in our space continuously. So we don't get one bias of one black blackness over whiteness. So this I love this idea of this continual kind of us cross fertilization of ideology happening all the time, and. Here I am on a beach in Cumbria, I spoke about earlier. That's in uh, Minnan. In, um, and that, that beach where I started this walk and drawing project I'm talking about now, it's a, a beach where essentially the, the, it's the Black Coombs is a, a big mountain or hill, big, a big mountain hill just at that location. And it's the only place in the UK where you can see the four countries. You can see Ireland, um, England, Wales and Scotland. So it's quite a, a kind of symbolic space. And, and, but I didn't know that until I got to know, <laughs> I got the permission to do the walk and walk and drawing. But this is a good example of this huge landscape. So I'm doing work in the landscape. So my work, sometimes an artist, when I said earlier on, I go out, I go and visit, I travel. And one of the places to find this beach and this is the local people loan me their horses to do this walking drawing. Can you believe that? They don't know me from Adam. I said, look, I've heard about your horses. Would it be possible if I could use them as a, as a, as a drawing experiment? And this is what happened. They, they loaned me the horses, didn't charge me anything. And that's how generous I was saying to you communities can be by you engaging with them and going down to where they are into their spaces and also including them, including them in the work. And this is one where we, these are people who turned up on the day to walk the drawing. Then I did that drawing on the beach and we filmed the experience. And some of these people are my family members in there. And um, and some of them are just the local people who turned up on the day. But within five hours, what each, each drawing was done on one day. One Each drawing was done on consecutive days. And um, one was done um, consecutive days. So it was, um, so it's like, so the, the, the each drawing took her five hours to do the, the time in, in which the tide leaves and returns each drawing was made and this drawing is really interesting because this was and it ended up the film and works were shown at the location i went back and showed them the work first then it came out and it went out into london and it went to various it went to the royal academy in london and then this went to um, trinidad to uh, in, in film festivals throughout the world and various other ones, and um, he ended up being collected by the um, government art collection. So now this is part of your, it, you own part, not own it, the work, but you own limited edition prints from this work. So you collectively own it because it's part of the government art collection. And that's what they do. Sometimes the governments that go around, they collect, um, look at artists that are doing, think they're interesting and they collect the works. But I'm going to talk about, I'm going to talk a few things I'll talk about, but that was giving a good example of journey and how, how that journey manifests itself in, in terms of a, a, an artwork. Uh, and the Walk of Dreads is one of my early works, but, it, um, but it's a, a, a proud work because I, I really like that idea I said earlier about community. That's really one of the things I like about the, these, these specific works. Um, 
Caribbean Takeaway Takeover. I'm going to talk about Caribbean Takeaway Takeover. I'm going to talk about two of the walkway memory. So time wise, I've got uh, we've got now for it, right. So uh, 40. So basically, I'm just looking at time in my head. So I've got this time. But this is really interesting because when I talked to you about you, um, you asked me about the the storytelling. And when I came back from my initial trip around the UK, uh, obviously I went back and spoke to my mother, and that's why I was able to convey some of those answers where she talked about my father, etc. And Caribbean Takeaway was a detective story. One of the things that I, I did was, first things I did with Black Story. So what happened was I recorded her mom's mother's story, which was very difficult to do because Black people, elders, don't like to talk about their stories so often. And so it was very difficult persuading her to part with her, her, her story. And then what I did was I found there's a space in, in Essex called up in Colchester. And I came across this takeaway in the middle of Norway, it felt, felt like an oasis. And um, I thought, oh my God, where does this place come from? And then in there, I thought, wow, wouldn't it be great to make this, this ordinary black Caribbean takeaway? Wouldn't it be great to make this a really nice artistic space? You can look at Aki and Sarfish and main, main menus. So I set about converting the stories from my mother, but not only my mother, but 12 individuals, elders I found around Essex. I could, I could, I, when I spoke to them, we went and spoke to them and recorded them. And um, we, 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 did the, we recorded them. We made sure that their recordings were archived in Essex record office because Essex rec record office is quite amazing depository of stories and recordings of all citizens around the UK but mostly from Essex they had no black recordings in there so we ended up talking to them so we got those recordings archived forever so you can listen to them then I thought about about how am I going to make the images so I ended up making these etchings of the people and, and these are some of the people we spoke to. This is Alfred Gardner. He's one of the um, elders and one of the first, one of the passengers and win, last passengers of Windrush, so the six left alive. So if you can see what I've done, I've taken what's taken over that takeaway and made it, you know, I put etchings on the walls and made recordings of people speaking on the, the Jamaican dialect and storytelling. And it was as it was almost like a high art space in the middle of Essex, in the middle of this takeaway, you know, this remote location. And why? Why a location like that? Why not? The, why in the museum in London? Why not? Why? Because I felt that it was a space that was black owned and controlled. It was a space that we could curate it. We could keep the exhibition on, on as long as we wanted to keep it on there. It was almost for me a tester as to how would we handle black story? How do you handle it in an artistic sense? And you know, we, we covered the tables. So what? So so it wasn't like a, a pressure space. The, the idea that you open a space and you come in, you listen to black stories, you eat Jamaican food. You know what I mean? So it's a space of some, an, a, almost like a a, a a a space with no power. A space with no power. So that the average white audience in, in Essex or the individuals living in Colchester would just venture into a space that they've never been before and hear a story they've never heard before. And that was a, you know, and this was how the elders received the space, they received the work. It was very much about the elders, it's them, you know, they, came, they hired their van, had their, their coach with their young, with their young, with their siblings, and they traveled from London, this small group, it's about 70 people, I believe, who, who was so heard about it, who wanted to experience it because they didn't think anything was there for them. And that's what I mean about culturally, it's important to communicate what we're doing to a cultural, uh, to our audience, to a white audience, yes, but to our own audience, to our own elders, uh, that they need to be spoke, they need to see themselves as well up there. You know, they want to see themselves, um, their stories treated preciously. And that's why, that's when I started to work with the, 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 that, the, the black imagery and black storytelling. It was about making sure that their stories are, are, are treated in a really interesting way. 
and you know, I've I've flipped through these these flies, but I give you an example of the other locations where the the story travelled. So out of Essex, it travelled to meet London, and it went on. It travelled into Lloyd's Banking Group. It's right there to this day in their, in their main cafeteria cafeteria area corporation at Lloyd's in the middle of the city of London have one of these in their in their offices. And to this day, they call and they say uh, they were saying to me. People are coming up to the desk and say, can, we've heard about the Eve Wright installation in this building. Can we come in? And I said, no, you can't. This is a bank. You can't enter this building. But to me, it was, it was a fact that this, it was so charming in the sense that, you know, the, the employees would sit down and then at lunchtime, unconsciously, unconsciously happen, across, happen against the image of a black person on the table when they're going to have their sandwiches and it's got little barcode, uh, QR codes on there. So they could just use their mobile phone and click on it and hear a, rich, a black rich story on it every day. It should be every day. And that's the point I was making earlier on about how our stories, you know, they could do one for Irish, they could do what Irish communities, they could do, but it should be on it every day. That's my point. Because so, so that, you know, you, you're able to listen, look at these stories, look at how the, these the documents were laid out and how they were accessible on office windows, you know? And, and we, we thought, oh, we could take it out. We go, no, 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 can we keep it in there? So to, to this day, it's in there. So Tilbury Walkway, I'll briefly go over this before I've got to play the video, but um, Tilbury Walkway was basically essentially where the, the, that's down at, um, this is really how, I wasn't intentional for Eva Arts to uh, put it here, but when we discovered this walkway, which is one of the walkways, which was used by the, the where the wind, Tilbury is placed um, terminal is where Windrush actually landed in the UK. So this is one of the walkways when you disembark the boat, people used to, used to go, you have to walk over these walkways to get into Britain. So this particular one has uh, 432 panes of glass in it. And on that 432 panes of glass, I managed to put images of not just 12, 12 families, but 130 families around the UK sent me imagery. And that's what's on the bridge. Essentially, it's kind of almost a, I call it a family album for the Wimless generation. But on the bridge, what you got? You got the White Defence League, who were the beginning of the, 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 so it can, you know, you've got the no colour bar dance which happened in Lambeth, where to somehow unification, because all the tension that happened at UK at the time. But look what's happened. You know, the bridge unfortunately has been attacked by, you know, the certain individuals in the locality. We don't know who, whatever. But that's got, that's got to show even this bridge is still being attacked. In 2020, 21, it's still so that that ideology, that kind of the British um, experience with migration has always been a checkered and very, very uh, fractious relationship. But um, you know, but what's who who are they attacking? So on the left hand side, on the right hand side, we've got um, John Tyndall. He's the founder of the National Front, and on the right hand side, we've got George Lloyd Weatherburn. He died last year from COVID-19, you know, a, a, alone, a, a separated by his family. They say he's not a victimless guy. Of course it's a victimless crime. Of course it's, a victim, of course it's not a victimless crime because on the bridge are stories from black individuals. But in a sense, it's, it's, it's racism is blind because the people who are shooting the bridge, they were shooting themselves. So in a sense, as I say about um, storytelling, um, it's like, you know, there is that we still as a community needs to we need to learn we need still lots to learn about each other but someone like Tilbury Walkway of Memory which you should go and see it if you've got time to see it because looking at it in pictures is one thing but going there and just experience where your, your ancestors entered the UK that's another experience and it's an artwork it's, that's why I made it that's why we made it there so don't know how long it's going to be there so don't tell, ask me how long it's going to be I don't know but we've taken it over. And that's one part of my art practice. I take over a space and I just take a chance and see how long they can keep it there. But people are rallying around it and people are protecting it, especially the community around Tilbury. They're loving it. They say, look, we want to preserve this. This is important. It's important. Our stories are important. 
Um, and there's some, individ some individuals, this experience, one of the individuals came down from South Bend and they, they've actually discovered their mother and father on the bridge. So these are some of the people who submitted their imagery, okay? So this is, this is what, 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 what it looks like. So anyway, so I've got to play this video now. <laughs> We've got time to stick it. So, um, so I can talk about, um, but yeah, this will give you an idea of some of the art, landscape um, artworks, what I've done when I've gone out in, 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 the, in, the, in Britain as a whole. But this video is, um, it's kind of interesting because at least I want to show you what happens in my studio. Um, I just want to, um, a, a bit of warning, there's a bit of nudity in, in some of the images, but it gives you an idea of what happens in, as an artist, for how I work, because you're, I'm speaking from my production office, but I have a, a, a worker space where I make actual artworks. I do paint, actually, I do make sculpture. So have a, have a look, and then we can go into questions, yeah? So I, bet I need to start, it's got time sticking. Okay, uh, share this, all right. This is me in the Wright Studio. My name is Eve Bryant, I'm a visual artist, and I like to create installations that build and confront spaces. I had to exit this London a long time ago. I needed space to work, and I kind of found myself out here in Perfleet. We're about 20 minutes from London. Yeah, this is kind of home in a way, as a studio where I work, it's a home. You know, I have my internet, of course, I have my phone and everything else, but sometimes you just need to be away from that technology for a while to be able to engage new thought processes and think about new mark making. It gave me time to come out and think about what type of work I wanted to make. I felt walking drawings was one of my projects I felt I wanted to sort of investigate the way the figure can enter a drawing and leave a drawing without being the subject of that drawing. We, uh, we created two works on that beach, uh, one with uh, heavy horses and the other with co co called Coloured People. It was the second drawing I did the second day. Um, I conceived um, Takeaway Takeover from out here. That was done in Colchester. I wanted to create a cultural space within that takeaway and then bringing that idea, transporting it into London. That was done this year at the Migration Museum. I use film when I need it, I use drawing when I need it, I use painting when I need it. I'm not, a, I'm not wedded to one specific art medium. I'm more interested in what medium works, what has the most effect. Andrew Black Woman is my new project. Look at these, look at these beautiful red berries. That's lovely colours. You know, sometimes you need a little bit of, uh, that little bit of silence so you can get your thoughts together, get your ideas together. This is where it all happens. This is where the, all the magic happens. So, so. I'm working on um, the 100 Black Women project. Uh, it involves 100 portraits of 100 Black women produced in different media, predominantly drawing and etching. When the model's in situ, I actually draw onto the plate. It's virgin when it arrives, no marks on it. Um, I, when the model comes to the studio, what I like to do, I like to do a series of drawings is before I start to etch. So um, these are ink drawings. So I can, I can, this dries, but I can, I can wash it off because it's, it's water-based and it's got, it's got a chemical in there that it's not supposed to stick to the plate because it's going to come, it's going to come off eventually. 
after the, this is dried on a plate, then I take it to the etching studio and I cover the whole plate with the acid, with, it's, it's like an acid resist. And then there's a process where I put this plate in hot water and all this, all this, neg this area here will dissolve and create a negative area. See, there's two plates that's got like um, two drawings in there. This is like an expression, interest in the abstraction of the figure, how to extra abstract it. And then obviously there's all that whole thing about the African body, the black body, you know, what does it look like? The spirit within the body. I'm, first and foremost for me is the, the mediums. I'm, I am, I need to engage myself with the material. And that material on this occasion is charcoal. And I've taken the charcoal, I've made a, a, a pictorial figurative representation of charcoal in the form of drawing. So I'm actually revealing the white paper coming through the black. So the, the, the whiteness is underneath and I'm putting black on top of the white paper and the black, the whiteness is shown, it comes through that blackness to form the imagery. So essentially the charcoal, like the black ink of Charbonnel or graphic chemical, uh, dark, dark blue or whatever those inks, there are, I, I'm always interested in um, the way, you know, so there is a kind of relationship. Of course, there's always that relationship with blackness, whiteness versus whiteness. How, you know, and in a way, they, the black and white coming together in the drawing is quite nice because they come in, it, it's, it's just, in fact, there's almost like unity going on between the two things. The whiteness of the paper versus the blackness of the charcoal. They both need to be in equilibrium to get the drawing. The people I'm communicating to are a black audience. I want them to see themselves within these drawings. I don't want to intellectualize everything. I don't want, I want it to be able to say, that's me. It's a representational installation and it's not just these drawings there's a body of work that's going to take over a space so the power of that the black body hopefully will resonate out in, into the gallery space you know what's going to happen I'm, I, I don't know yet i always work in a series i always have different works going at different times this is the part of the series i've been working on for the past few years i call them kissy pennies based around African old money that was used in the slave era. I make my kissing pennies from two elements. The Africom, the decorative part, this is on, on some old Dutch furniture. So it says new black, it says new black on it. <laughs> so with those two elements, I made, I made molds of the both of them. So I intend to create artworks from them. But this is a passport holder. And my passport will sit in the centre. Here's one of the pieces I've made. This is made out of nickel silver and the stuff that we use to make money with. And these are just all the same elements repeated over and over again. And let's take these same elements and create this sort of an English, it was like a British lady. All, all artists can do is pursue what means something to him or her. I have no specific ambition. It's more about, I want to put something out there culturally that makes sense first to myself and may, maybe makes sense to people, other people. It's a, it's a very loaded cultural space, the art world. There's a lot of things out there that determines whether you're successful or not. Producing art isn't like saying, I'm being an accountant or being a, a lawyer or whatever, where there's a, there's a, a structured career a pathway you can walk along. All you can do is, as, a, as an artist is work within your realm. You want to find answers to internal questions. Why are there more black art featured within major collections? You know, what, why, why isn't that happening? We're producing art. Why are we represented? So...
and stuff. So, so there, there you have it. <laughs> Eat right. <laughs> There's a lot there. But, there uh, was. Thank you, Eve Right. I mean, that that was. I'm, I'm a bit lost for words, actually. I think your work is amazing, and I think such a great message in all of it as well. And uh, I'm just conscious that we are running at its time, but I'm hoping that people uh, are able to hang on just to hear Eve Right answer a few questions before we finish up. Um, so I'm just going to have a look through the chat, and if you wouldn't mind just quickly answering some of the questions that we had, Eve Right. So the first one is, uh, do you think that there that now there is a good connection of all black people having connection to the Afri African diaspora, or is there still, or is it still fragmented? Sorry. I think um, I think there's if we can understand that if we either talk about community, and I understand there's, there's African communities, there's there's uh, Jamaican communities, there's Trinidadian communities, there's um, you know we're all we're the, the most like there's. Our, we all come out of diaspora, we all come out of Africa. And there's no denying that. We all, humanity has. But yes, there is, I think it's, um, I think we're embracing each other more and more. I think Afrobeat is a good example of how they've taken Jamaican reggae, um, um, Calypso, you know what I mean? And Afrobeat, you know what I mean? So that's a good example of a, a, a homogenization of, of culture and and it's great and we're all enjoying that and we're all loving it so i i think i think when i was growing up there was but i think there's less now i think we're we're, we're embracing each other's communities a lot more as, a, as a, 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 a our differences i'll say i you know jollof rice love jollof rice they like you know um um jerk chicken you know we, it's all the same you know we're all enjoying it a bit more it's less stigma but when I was growing up, there was a lot less of that, really. Lovely, thank you. Uh, another one, when you were younger, did you find it easy to talk with your parents about their journey, uh, not only to the UK, but their history and their ancestry? I think you, you commented a bit about that, didn't you, already? But Yeah, not so difficult. It was very difficult. But our parent, I, I felt as though, and we talked about it on the bridge, we had a tour on the weekend, how our, our parents didn't want to talk about it. The, the lot of the racism um, they experienced, but actually on the bridge itself and some of the recordings we've got on the bridge, that some of the elders do start to talk about the the harshness of the the the, the reception they received coming into the UK, and uh, one of the reasons I felt maybe our parents didn't want to just didn't want to burden us with it. I felt they were dealing with it. And they just wanted to just look, go to school, learn your book. The only time my mother was angry with me, if she, she felt I wasn't studying or for, I weren't trying my hardest to do my best, you know? And I think part, and so, but I, I felt it took a lot of persuading for her to start to open up a little bit before she died to get to her to, to record her story. But it's worth the effort, you know? It's worth the effort. Absolutely. Uh, and just lastly, you had some asking about um, if you could just mention a little bit about the impact and legacy of the archive, which you spoke about. The archive is so, so, so important. Um, Essex Record Office is a depository of story uh, for recording. So if you've got recordings, you've got to record, you could approach them independently and um, you could, they have a standard in which they receive the recording. So you have to there's a, there's a, they, and also they've got like, um, they have um, tutorials to show you how to do it. But it's really important that you, if you have recordings of your parents' story, or you, you know, they say you, that you approach people like Essex to say, look, is it possible to have those here? Because they really take care of them and, and it's there for everyone forever. So the idea is that you deposit story special recording story, not so much video, they're more about audio stories. And then, you, you know, you, you, it's there for, for, for everyone to enjoy. And also it's great to go and listen to some of the English accents and the Jamaican dialect, the different accents from, we're not all, you know, from Patois to, you know, the English, old English dialects. It's great. It's a great place to go and listen to um, the citizens of, of Essex and how they spoke and how they conversed and, you know, so it, it's, um, we've got some, we've got some um, stories there now. We've got um, 22, 21 stories there and um, we want to do more. 
that's not enough yeah thank you thank you so much i mean uh, we, we've run to time i thought i could talk Hello. to you for another hour <laughs> um, but just a, a really special thank you to eve right and then and thank you for all those who attended the session um obviously we've run over a little bit but the recording of the event will be available uh, on essex library's youtube channel and we'll also email the link out to all attendees as well um just to mention there are a number of books about windrass by a range of authors available by the essex libraries both in physical book form ebook and also audio book uh, and our next event for Black History Month is on Wednesday, the 27th of October, uh, and it's in conversation with storyteller Alim Kamara. Uh, details will be shared in the chat, which I think they already have been. Um, so just again, a huge thank you to Eve Wright and Ioni as well in the background. Uh, and thank you all uh, and have a good rest of the day. Great. Right. Can, can I say one more thing before we go? I mean, there are some more questions which I, I will try and answer, and I'll probably send that to you guys if there's some questions Perfect. in there. So I will send us, us, I will put that on so when you, you see the recording, you're able to play that, um, so you'll have those answers. And uh, there's one question you didn't ask about my favourite book I would recommend, and I want to recommend, um, everyone should read the IC3 uh, Black Anthology, which has been published, um, it's republished recently, and uh, it's edited by Courtney Newland, and um, um, Khadida Sese, and also um, and Ione Richards is included in that, in one of her pieces. So, uh, so it's a fantastic book, uh, a, a basically storytelling uh, of, of the high order. And some of the writers you hear about today started, this started 20 years ago, this book, they've republished it and it's an amazing book to read. So you should get hold of that in your libraries and go and find it, it's great. Lovely, thank you. And I can see the link's been pushed in the chat as well, so people can have a look at that. Uh, so thank you, thank you all, and have a good rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you.